Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I am your host. And in today's episode, I'm talking with Alastair Kirkpatrick. Alastair works at Stratus Landscape Architecture and was previously at ACAS Landscape Architecture. And that's where he may be better well known for building a couple of um, show gardens at the moment, International Flower and Garden Show in the Boutique Gardens. A couple of gardens that got people thinking about sustainability and the impact that we're having on the environment. So we discussed those two gardens in this episode as well as the uh, reason behind him going from ACAS to Stratus Landscape Architecture and he's also a teacher at Melbourne Polytechnic and RMIT and has done since he was working since he was learning there. So in this chat we'll talk about how he got into the industry uh, where he worked and studied as well as why he likes teaching. It was awesome to have someone like Alistair on because he's someone who won't just go along with the with the crowd he'll uh, stand up for what he believes in so People like that are the ones who change the world for the better. So it was good to have have him on and uh, even what he's doing at the uni where, where he's teaching, adding the horticulture into a, a landscape architecture course. It'd be easy just to teach what he's asked to teach and do his job as he's expected and just roll along. But uh, he he can see the benefit of people learning about horticulture, so he teaches that. So it's great to have people like Alistair and hopefully you enjoy this chat with him. Alistair, thank you very much for joining us on the Landscaping Podcast. My first question for you is, how did you start in the industry? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. So it's a bit of a difficult question to answer. I suppose my passion for growing plants and the outdoor environment in general started when I was five years old. My mum snapped off an agaranthemum, the common daisy bush, and she said, if you put this in the ground and you water it every day, it'll grow. And I thought, there's no way that could be true. Parents lie to you all the time. (laughs) And lo and behold, I watered every day and it grew into this daisy bush. And from that moment, I was hooked. I was like, this is incredible. I can be a part of the process of life and an agent in creating life. So the time I was 12, I'd taken over the entire quarter acre block where I grew up in the suburbs of Melbourne. had Japanese gardens, fish ponds, rose gardens, herb gardens, you name it. So it had been like this kind of hobby and passion, but I never really thought of it as being a career until 26 and got a job in a garden centre. So I'd never been formally trained in horticulture and, but because it was a obsession of mine, I kind of gathered all this knowledge and kind of knew more about plants than a lot of the people who had, you know, a diploma of horticulture that were working at the nursery. So then of course we had the terrible millennial drought, which you may or may not remember, yep. which had a huge impact on our industry. And so I ended up working at a bank and I moved to London, then worked at clothing shops and all these different kind of jobs that had nothing to do with landscape architecture, garden design or horticulture. And um, yeah, it, it drew me back. I decided to re-educate myself as a landscape architect. Started in 2008 at RMIT. I graduated in 2012 with a distinction of Masters of Distinction, sorry, of Landscape Architecture and started Acus Landscape Architecture with Anthony Sharples at that point. So did you meet him at uh, RMIT? Yes. yes. Yeah. So we and then, started yeah, together. They decided it. So we, was it while you were studying, you thought we should, when we finish, we'll go out together? To be like brutally honest, when we graduated in 2012, there was just no work for landscape architects. Yeah, right. And so we thought, oh, well, we're going to have to start our own business because we can't get a job. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, I think it's one of those things, like those big decisions in life, you wouldn't do it if you knew what it entailed, but had that naivety and that enthusiasm allows you just to go into it and go, yeah, it'll be all right. Yeah. And um, yeah, we built a very successful business together. I've sold my half of the business to him and I've moved on now to working elsewhere. But yeah, it, it worked well for us. And which bank did you work at? <laughs> the National Australia Bank. Oh, I, I spent some time at the bank as well. So uh, was, where did you Commonwealth. Work? Commonwealth, yeah. Yeah. So what, did you enjoy working there or you just, it was just another job? Oh, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I was in an office in front of a computer and uh, it was one of the kind of driving forces to go, you know, even though I went back to study at 30, I thought, it's worth it to kind of live the student life again for another five years, just to not ever have to be in that position of working in a bank or a call center or a bar or yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny when you when you're in the moment, like when you're you know 26, you feel like you know spending another four or five years in study feels like a lifetime. But then when you're 31, you think, oh, that that wasn't so bad. Now that yeah. you're actually out of it and doing what you want to do. So true. So what what sort of stuff did you do in London? Did you were you interested in gardens when you were over there? Like we enough to go to look at any gardens over there? Oh, definitely. So, I mean, I did the typical Aussie thing of getting a two-year working visa and I was working in a bar. Yeah. But I also had the um, fantastic opportunity of designing a rooftop garden in Brick Lane in East London. Cool. And it was a really interesting challenge because the building was a terrace house built in like 1720. Uh, so, you know, you imagine what the KPI on the roof of that is. It's like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also they had incredibly narrow little hallways and really steep staircases. So getting all the materials up there was part of this incredible design challenge. So we got all the plants from uh, Caledonia Road Market. And first of all, we went to an op shop to buy a skateboard to transport all the plants. <laughs> and so then we pushed them along the road in a skateboard and then had to carry them up. There was seven flights of stairs to this rooftop. And it was, uh, it was 800 mil wide. <laughs> so it's like, it was crazy, but I went to B&Q, which is the equivalent of Bunnings, and I found these amazing hardwood decking tiles that you just clip together. I think that product now exists in Australia, but, you know, this was way back in 2006. And that was fantastic because it actually meant we could have decking out there and then filled the rest of it with all lightweight pots. It was actually, we couldn't even have plastic pots. It had to be polystyrene because of the weight restrictions. So then we had to, I had to think, well, how on earth can I make this look good? You know, like, so um, I used a combination of like textured paints to paint the polystyrene. And then of course, a lot of cascading plants to hide it. So in the end, it actually looked quite nice. Yeah, nice. So how did you get that? How did that come about? I was living in Sydney before I moved to London and I was working at a clothing shop then and one of our regular clients, you know, I just said, oh, look, I've done garden design, worked in nurseries. And they said, oh, when you come to London, do my rooftop. So like a lot of kind of things, it's word of mouth, isn't it? Yeah. So when you were studying RMIT, was there much uh, plant knowledge that you learnt or, or was everything you learnt you already had? Yeah, well, I mean, this, is, this has been one of my kind of passions in my career since I graduated because um, I really want to change the situation. Basically, in the landscape architecture degrees and masters, there's virtually no content uh, that teaches the students anything about plants. Yeah. So when I went through the program, there was one subject called Plant ID, and that was in 2008 in the first year. Then the cohort that came in in 2009, that subject was removed. It says from 2009 onwards, there's been no plant knowledge taught in the landscape architecture program at RMIT at all. <laughs> That's insane, isn't it? Yeah. And I've, because I've been teaching within the program for a decade, you know, like I have written electives because the students say, I really want to know about plants. And so the students can learn about plants through these electives that I've written and, and created. But if I'm not there because I'm a new sessional staff member, it doesn't exist. So, mm -hmm. and that's the thing, like, that's the amazing thing about our profession as designers that work with living organisms is we're living, we're sorry, we're designing with dynamic things, things that grow and change and die and move and react. It's a totally different form of design to interior or architecture where you're dealing with static abiotic objects. Mm. And but that's it. it seems like that's what they're teaching you though, is just about the, the non-living items that you're learning about. Yeah. So when with ACAS, how did you, well, first of all, did it take long to think of the name? Was there was there other options you, you thought of as well? It was one of the hardest things about starting was coming yeah. up with a name. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we thought of a name, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's awesome. And then look up the domain, oh, it's taken. <laughs> oh, that's taken. So in the end, it was just a combination of our initials, Alistair Kirkpatrick, Anthony Sharples, and worked. And also it was like a benefit to have a business name, business name starting with A. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually didn't even think about that, but that was good. Yeah, so we started the business doing the NICE scheme, which is the it's new, new... The enterprise? Yeah, new, new enterprise new, incentive new scheme? Enterprise scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was awesome because as a part of that, 
they you do a cert for in business, so you learn how to you know do the books, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And then for the first six months of the business, like you can earn, earn as much money while you get like a base universal income from the government. And we wouldn't have been able to the business wouldn't have got off its feet without that, and also without the teaching work at RMIT. So you started teaching as soon as you finished, did you? Yeah. There yeah, right. So how did you go back getting design work to start with? Yeah, well, the first, while we're doing the NIST scheme, we completely um, designed and built from scratch Anthony's mother's garden so we could have something to put on the website. Yep. And I think going to RMIT and doing the course was really good because we were connected to a lot of people in the industry. And so we contacted the age and said, oh, come and look at this amazing garden. We've just built all out of recycled materials. They thought it was interesting. They wrote an article about us. So we kind of knew how to kind of promote ourselves without capital outlay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was a very slow burn to start off with. You know, the first kind of uh, client that we had had a surname that um, I won't say their name, but it was, you know, horticulturally related. And we just assumed that one of our friends was taking the piss. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, it took them ages to kind of convince us that they were a real client and they were just a complete stranger. We're like, oh, wow, amazing. <laughs> they did. So you did a job for Joseph Banks here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so did you always have the um, – because when I first came wherever you was from the two gardens, you built the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show and they've got uh, – they're more of a mindful garden in terms of you actually thinking about – the environment and sustainability did you always have that uh, passion during your study a hundred percent yeah yeah i mean i think that the greatest existential threat to humanity is climate change you know and it's kind of we have this amazing opportunity in our industries you know of landscape architecture horticulture garden design and construction to be at the forefront of best practice when it comes to sustainability and not approach it in a kind of tokenistic uh, fashion and um you know one of my passionate passionate hatreds is artificial grass you know like because it's marketed as being environmentally responsible and it's the exact opposite you're covering the earth in plastic you know and then to keep the swords of the grass upright you've got to put micro bead plastics amongst it that get get washed into the drains and whole generations of children are growing up playing on plastic grass and associating that in their childhood memories as being grass. It's just, it's just criminal. I've written many articles for Landscape Architecture Australia and, and one of my, the first one I ever wrote was called The Emperor's New Clothes about um, artificial turf. So I know I'm rambling, but the to go back to your question, that's kind of was the key thing about my design practice is that if a client says, I want artificial turf, I'll just say, I'm really sorry. No judgment, but you'll have to find someone else to design it for you because I just won't do that. Yep. And there's kind of several of those kind of sticking points where it's just like, no, nah, you know, I've worked too long and too hard to get where I am in my career to make those kind of compromises. Mm. There, yeah, there's a like, there's a lot of um, token gestures that I've seen. It's not, it's I think it's less so much now, but uh, but maybe like five to ten years ago, uh, people saying they were being sustainable but weren't in terms of what they were what they were putting out um but yeah that there, there seems to be a lot of meaning behind the gardens that you designed for the garden show um there was there did you have like feel like there was a lot of risk in doing that at the garden show with the first one especially yes and no like we knew it wasn't going to generate business for us <laughs> um so it was definitely not uh kind of a marketing move but we saw it as this amazing opportunity to communicate with a huge audience because you know in 2019 I think it was a crazy number of people something like two to three hundred thousand people came through the show or something I can't remember the exact number but you know to be able to actually communicate that to an audience and an audience that's not expecting to see something that is going to be political or radical in that environment kind of ups the shock factor and all we want to do is to make people think and the fact that all of that plastic that we used in that show garden in 2019 was collected in 15 minutes with two rubbish claws by us at the Swan Street Bridge at the Yarra River, you know, that is so alarming that we could 
there's that much plastic pollution in a so-called developed nation where we look after our environment. And I think it made people really think, and it's because it looked pretty as well. It was aesthetically pleasing initially. You didn't know what it was when you walked up to it. And that kind of worked well to start the conversation about plastic pollution. So can you just describe that garden for anyone who didn't see it? The garden itself, we wanted it to look like a slice of the landscape. So we created false deposits. Um, and all of the materials, because we wanted to make sure that we're, there was a sincerity in the design, were recycled and found objects. Um, so we created the different levels of pallets. And so the idea was it was a very steep landscape and the front was cut in and it was showing the stratification of soil levels as if you would cut into the landscape itself. There's a new type of rock that was described in the early 2000s as plastiglomerate, because there's plastic in our oceans now. In Hawaii, when the lava flows in, it melts the plastic and has created this new rock type, which is a fusion between plastics and rocks. Right. But they, geologists predict that in the future, because of the phenomenal amount of plastic in the ocean, it'll eventually get covered in um, biotic life forms, get heavy enough to sink to the bottom, and then it will become strata, just like you see in sedimentary rock, like sandstones or siltstones. So we were wanting to kind of create an extraction or a replication of that plastic conglomerate stratification of plastics. And you just talk about how they're everywhere and in so much a part of our environment. Then the plants that we chose to use were all plants that you could use in a xeriscape garden. So Xeriscape, as you know, is any plants that will grow on the rainfall of your region once established. So we had like a copse of eucalyptus polyanthemus at the back, uh, with the understory planting of Lamandria formis. And then in the front, we had this kind of weird dystopian kind of landscape of Sempervirens uh, succulents. And then these dishes of, of um, Saracaronia and pitcher plants coming out. The metal for our kind of protruded, uh, protruded pergola was made from a building that was being demolished in Coburg. And instead of using rocks, we used um, smashed concrete that we borrowed from the Kirk tip in Brunswick. Yeah. So did you, were you surprised when they uh, accepted the design? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very surprised. I, I was more surprised when they asked us back. Yeah. Yeah, so you got asked back in so last uh, this year in 2022. So what was yeah. the what well, describe this year's garden for anyone who didn't see it? So this one, we really wanted to say, you know, unless we act absolutely immediately, like all the world's scientific community has been saying for the last 20 years, it's going to be too late. So we wanted to kind of demonstrate what too late might look like. So. Uh, we designed your archetypal uh, Victorian weatherboard cottage that you'd find in Coburg, Brunswick, Paran, South Yarra. And this house has collapsed and it's sinking into this kind of pool of water with smashed windows and totally overgrown with penicillium clandestinum like, growing up all over the roof. And it's kind of this kind of jarring image of this suburban normal house everyone can relate to sinking into the earth with a huge neon sign on the roof saying coming soon. It was interesting because when we were constructing it with North Landscapes, the guys next to us said, oh, that's a bit in bad taste considering the floods. But of course we designed it two years prior to the floods occurring. But of course the floods are so extreme because of climate change. And my comment back to those people that were saying it was in bad taste was it's like, well, I think the government's inaction on climate change is an extremely poor taste. <laughs> and, you know, like it's anyone who's got children or anyone who cares about the future at all should be passionately concerned and worried about this. And, you know, we're seeing extreme bushfires, extreme flooding, you know, we're seeing flooding in metropolitan areas in Sydney. We're seeing cyclonic winds rip through the Wombat State Forest. You know, it looks like it's been clear fell like it's happening right now so the urgency is immediate and it needs to happen and so that's why that was the idea of this garden well there's, there was flooding back then in march in uh new south wales when you did it and now as we recorded this is flooding in new south wales again so. yeah yeah exactly it's funny because the 
the guys from North Landscapes did such a good job of building the house. Um, the comments that we kept on getting was, how did you get a, an actual house into the exhibition building? <laughs> they thought that we'd brought in a real house. So, um, yeah, they're very, very talented. And it's what we were discussing at the beginning of our conversation about how construction can be a form of design. Because obviously we had drawn it all in AutoCAD and we'd Photoshopped it and we had designed it. But their interpretation to take it to that level, just it was they did such a phenomenal job. So was that all like recycled as well? Yes. The only thing that wasn't recycled were the structural timbers because the engineer at Mifka says you'd be familiar with insisted on that for safety. Um, all hail to the OHS God. Um, <laughs> but that uh, timber got reused in a project. Uh, North Landscapes reused that timber. Yep. And also the pond liner got was new as well, but they got reused as well. Yeah. There's such it's uh, with both gardens it's there's the um yeah there's the meaning behind the garden but you've also, the plants are also like really impressive like the way that they're all put together so it's not just like it's a, a piece of art that's you know on its own it's uh it yeah it gels really well as well so you've got kind of there's two kind of uh, ways to look at it you can look at it in the overall scheme of things but when looking at it as a normal garden it's they're beautiful as well yeah, well, we're very, very lucky with the plants because, you know, all the delays because of COVID, obviously, meant that, you know, anyone who was showing in this 2022 garden had only, you know, four months to, to get plants, materials, everything. And so in our first show garden, you know, the plants were very well designed and very well thought of, but this time it was this desperate free-for-all of like, what can we get? But we were very, very lucky in what we could get because we got most of the plants that we wanted, which was thanks to the generosity of our amazing sponsors. And we got some really, really beautiful plant combinations. You know, like I think that contrast between the kind of really soft, ethereal, flowy grasses with a really strong silver, bold foliage, it just, it's always such a winning combination. We had that beautiful persicaria this year with that really delicate, you know, white and pink flower which always looks incredible, you know, when you back it with things like cerastigmia, which is also one of my favourite plants. So, yeah, we had some awesome, awesome plants. So that was great. And how was the feedback you got for that garden from the, from the public? The public absolutely loved it. All right. they, yeah, they thought it was phenomenal. They kind of, they were shocked because we had 2.6 million in fluoro at the front as well, which was uh, the amount of, forest that was going to be cleared in the five days that Mifkus was open to the public. Yeah, that's insane. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah, it was 2.6 billion hectares was going to be destroyed in those five days. So people were really shocked, but people also, you know, you could tell a lot of people just wanted to get an Instagram photo in front of it because it was something unusual. Mm. So, yeah, the public's response was really good. So that was good. So have you got any work out of either one of them? It's very hard to know if it's direct I think, you know, the media interest in our um, projects and our show gardens was huge. And so I think that does have a follow-on ripple effect. I think the profile of ACUS, but also myself and Anthony as individuals has been elevated because of that. Like, for example, for the 2019 uh, garden, I was interviewed on ABC Morning News and I think I went for like five minutes or something. Absolutely terrifying because it's live. <laughs> and they're like, don't use big words and don't swear. And I'm like, oh, and it was like <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning. I only had my first coffee and I was like, just don't say um, don't say um. Uh, that was good though. And I was shocked how many people watch the morning news. Uh, and then this year, you know, we had an amazing article on The Guardian. We had two articles in The Age. We were on Gardening Australia. So... I think that's the thing. If you do something that's topical and uh, left of centre, you're definitely going to get a lot more media interest. Mm. So what, what was the reason behind, like, and you, if it's, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but uh, getting out of the business or selling your part of the business? Yeah, I, there was no animosity. It was just time for a change. I've really, really loved the teaching aspect. So I've always done, you know, 30% uh, teaching, 70% business. And, and, you know, Anthony has other side hustles as well. 
Uh, so it, it worked for us well in that regard. But it, it gets time in any business where it starts to get big and it starts to, you know, you need to hire staff and all the rest of it. And I think for me, like the teaching is, is my main passion and I like to be kind of uh, allowed to be flexible. So at the moment, you know, I'm doing two days a week for Stratus Landscape Architecture and that's awesome because it's the right balance at the moment between teaching and then the designing. And I've started a whole new branch of the business, which is um, specialising in domestic garden design because Stratus, they specialise in doing really fascinating nature play stuff for like schools and parks. So much more civic, larger projects. Yep. And so that's really exciting too, just to have something new. I think you just need to keep things fresh. And, mm. and yeah, what is it about teaching that you enjoy the most? I just, I'm always perpetually amazed by the ideas that students come up with. You know, like you'll have 25 pedestrian ideas and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then someone will come out with something so left field and you're like, that is awesome. And, and also just being a part of their journey, you know, like when you see that light bulb moment and, you know, like I've been doing it now, like I was saying for a decade, so some of the people who are like, you know, emerging practitioners in landscape architecture who are doing really well were my students. And I remember them when they like, were like new to the to everything. And now to see them as really successful professionals, it makes me feel proud. I kind of get a paternal feeling, I suppose. Yep. Well, are there any any names that you can share who you've you taught who people would know? Um, yeah, I mean like. They may know them, I'm not sure, like Matt Calder, uh, someone that I taught and then we actually hired him for a while. Uh, he's kicking a lot of goals, but I think because I've been teaching up until this year exclusively in landscape architecture, there is like that weird thing between landscape design, landscape construction and landscape architecture tends to be kind of kept separate. There are people who cross over, you know, like for example, I obviously didn't teach her because I went to uni with her, Emmeline Bowman. Do you know her? Yeah, yeah. We uh, One of those boutique gardens that I built, oh, I came second and, that, and that's the one she won. Ah, awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, Emmeline's awesome. So we went to, you know, through uni together yeah, right. and did the same course. Uh, but she's definitely someone like myself who's crossed over, you know, between the worlds of landscape design, landscape construction and landscape architecture. But a lot of my students who graduate from landscape architecture can have stayed very much in the world of landscape architecture and they don't, there's like not much crossover. And I think there needs to be more cross pollination between the industries. So, do you mean they do more like the stuff that you learn during the landscape architecture course? Like that's not so much domestic design. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much, you know, like um, civic scale things. So, designing ferry terminals or huge, you know, um, housing estates out in Melton and like very, very large scale stuff. Mm. Yeah, I imagine there'd be yeah, some people yeah. who are doing that, but I, I would have thought there'd be a lot more who have a passion for doing the domestic side of things. Yeah, well, I suppose those people who really love to do the domestic side of things would qualify in landscape design rather than landscape architecture, and they'd end up with a lot smaller hex debt <laughs> <laughs> so when you're so you're teaching students who are doing landscape architecture correct no oh uh, so well i've just started working at melbourne polytechnic so now i'm teaching um students who are doing diploma of horticulture uh landscape design and also some landscape construction cert three people as well oh cool yeah that'd be make it even more interesting because there's more of a vast array of different skills that they're that they're learning yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so what is it? What certain subjects do you teach? So, at the moment at Melbourne Poly, I'm teaching um, sustainability and horticulture. So, basically, you know, what sustainable practices are uh, within the horticultural profession. Uh, after this midterm break, I'm going to be teaching how to put together documentation packages for the Cert for Diploma of Landscape Design. Um, so that's, you know, how to do contract administration, uh, putting together a specification package, the documentation, all that stuff. And then for the Cert 3, it's plant establishment. So if you're planting out like a really large project, how do you do it and reduce the rate of attrition to make sure that it's profitable, but also the design actually 
works. Yeah. Do you plan on uh, keeping the the balance between teaching and and working for Stratus the same? But like, have you got a like a five year plan or anything that you're working towards? Yeah, I'm keeping it really open because you know if life has taught me anything, uh, the only thing that's uh, got any certainty is change. Yeah. So you know, with rising interest rates and inflation and all the kind of general horror show that the economy is seemingly heading towards at the moment. I think it's very good to actually have multiple options. You know, I think big projects will keep going and that'll be fine and, and established companies will be able to weather the storm. Um, but if you're small or just starting out and you branch within the company, it could be a, kind of a bit of a shaky time. If things get really bad, I'm not sure how many people will be getting their gardens designed. You know? mm. Yeah, um, I thought the same with, because uh, no one in terms of, I think it's the same with design. No one can find anyone in construction to to work. There's no employees looking for for new opportunities. But I'm wondering whether that's going to change when things get a lot more difficult because there'll be people who won't be able to who won't be able to get work because at the moment even bad landscapers can get work. So yeah. eventually yeah. that will change. So was, yeah, like have you got design companies contacting you to see if there's any good students that they should be putting on? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, I'm always recommending, you know, students. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, because it's really interesting because you really get a, a fascinating insight into someone's work ethic, how they deal with pressure, how they deal with deadlines, uh, how they deal with stress, how they work in an interpersonal way, how they would work in a workplace. Like, it's a really kind of, it reveals a lot especially the when I was teaching the master's students at Melbourne Uni and that last year is like intense pressure. And so the ones that are kind of, you know, stay calm, keep on top of it, listen to feedback, but interpret it and bring their own thing to it. You go, yeah, you, you've got all those skills that can be translated into being, you know, a really good employee. Mm -hmm. so have you had any frustrations with, because um, I know I've spoken to a few people who were taught at TAFE and they want to teach, but there's all the um, backside of work, like the paperwork and pl planning and that sort of thing that's not so much the enjoyable part of teaching that they have to do, which they can't stand. Have you, do you have to do that kind of stuff as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, have you ever read or seen The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No. Nah. There's um, this alien race called the Vogons, and, and they just get off on bureaucracy, and their whole thing is that, like, everything has to have 17 million forms and it's going to be stamped 17 times. And, and um, I've got this running theory that the Vogons have actually secretly taken over the earth and no one noticed because <laughs> every, everywhere, it doesn't matter whether it's TAFE University, a call center, the level of bureaucracy now is so extreme and it's phenomenally frustrating. And this kind of idea of efficiency by bringing in 17 types of software, it's just, it kills me, but at the same time, it's just part of modern life. So rather than rallying against it, I just have to kind of take a deep breath and go, yep, this is taking far too much time. It would have been a lot quicker to send an email, but I'm going to do what needs to be done. Yeah, it's got a role with it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, well, that's it. So what do you do outside of teaching and working? Uh, I love bushwalking. I'm actually on a two-week holiday at the moment, like I was saying to you on the phone. I was up in North Queensland, which was awesome, seeing a whole different suite of species and how the plants are growing. Like uh, seeing Araucaria Cunninghamii, the hoop pines growing on the Whitsunday Islands. Yeah. It's just fascinating because, you know, that's where they're indigenous to. But it makes, them, makes it look like British Columbia because here you are in the tropics, but then you've got these steep islands covered in conifers. You know, it's such a bizarre juxtaposition and uh, I went on a bushwalk up to this lookout at uh, Whitehaven Beach and there was this amazing kind of floriferous mass and I thought oh I wonder what rare tropical beauty that's going to be and then I had a look at it and it was Pandora Pandoriana <laughs> <laughs> I was like what are you doing growing here so it's fascinating to that stuff will grow that far up north uh -huh. but yeah then alternatively seeing all the amazing stuff that you definitely yeah, it just doesn't grow down here. You know, like the uh, giant spathophyllums that were three metres high, like 
it was just crazy seeing peace lilies that were bigger than me and you know, growing in the ground and Bismarckia nobilis, like in a whole avenue of it. And each like leaf was about 1.5 by 1.5 metres. And there was this incredible pond just nearby um, that was full of like this most amazing blue water lily, like it was sky blue. And the flowers were 40 centimetres across and sticking out of the water about half a metre as well. <laughs> so amazing. But um, yeah, I love bushwalking. I love gardening. So I was lucky enough four years ago to buy my own place in uh, the you know, relatively inner north of Melbourne. I couldn't afford a house at that stage, but my stipulation is I had to have a garden because that's kind of my mental therapy and it keeps me you know, on an even keel. So I managed to find a unit that had a 70 square metre garden on the title. So body corporate can't say anything. Yeah. And I had huge big fence around it as well so I can do whatever I want. So I managed to squeeze in 287 at last count different species of plant in 70 <laughs> square metres. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not what you'd call a minimalist garden. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, have you got? Have you had trouble leaving it and not just changing things all the time? Oh yeah, I'm, I I do change stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've taken over the communal driveway as well, yep. and the nature strip. So <laughs> I've been eyeing off the neighbours' front gardens as well. So that'll be next. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be fine with that. Yeah, yeah, well, like I asked one and they were like, mm, no, and I'm like, oh, I'll wear you down. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a favourite plant? Oh, that's the $10 million question, isn't yeah. it? Um, I'd say my favourite plant in my garden at the moment is the ficus demeropsis. It's this amazing ficus from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So it grows there 2,000 metres above sea level, which is why you can grow it outside in Melbourne. And I'd seen it um, you know, for years growing. There, I think there's four specimens in the botanical gardens. And they just have this amazing, amazing leaf form where it looks like a giant crinkle cut um, crisp. <laughs> and then like, and this dark, dark green. And the leaves are huge. They're about two metres long. So you mean a rare plants up in Mumbolk, they sell them. So... <laughs> managed to get one at great expense. All my non-gardening friends thought I was insane. They were like, because I only had one leaf on it. They're like, you spent that much on this? I'm like, no, you don't get it. This plant is amazing. So it's doing really well. I think one of my favourite plants when I'm designing other people's gardens is Wallenbergia communis. Uh, it's a locally indigenous bluebell. Uh, just because it's so tough, but so delicate looking, it'll flower all summer long. Survive with no summer rainfall. It's just a real performer. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'm going to have to check out that ficus because I do like a rare plant. It's been, yeah, and that sounds like, like I like a tropical kind of garden. That sounds like it might fit that bill. Yeah. Does it, look, does it kind of look tropical? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It looks, it's amazing. <laughs> Did you say you saw them up at, in uh, Queensland as well? No, I haven't seen them up hot. in Queensland. Is it too hot oh. for them up there? Yeah, it might be actually. Yeah, because they because they grow up in the highlands of New Guinea. So mm. I imagine they'd grow really well in Sydney. But um, the only time I've ever seen them outside my own garden is at the Botanical Gardens, Melbourne. Oh. All right, Alistair, thank you so much for coming on today. I've absolutely loved having a chat with you. And, um, yeah, that's, I love having plant people on. So, yeah, really enjoyed it. And thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you so much for asking me. So, yeah, that's been, it's been awesome to have a chat with you.